So I'm going to get into the sutta, and um, I think Venerable Upeka covered last week's uh, topic while I was teaching at Guy House. And now we're on page 172, chapter 10, Establishing an Equitable Society. So this comes after we've already, through this book, whether you've been doing it in life or not, I don't know, but through the book anyway, we've settled disputes. We have... Um, apparently been in some disputes as well that's, that's probably a universal phenomena we have learned about the intentional community and also about one's own good and the good of others and good friendship proper speech dealing with anger uh, personal training and right understanding, right view from where the whole path begins. So now we're on actually establishing that equitable society. And it's starting to go through uh, relationships that are mostly applicable, I suppose, to everybody, um, but largely to lay folks, which is nice because a lot of this is about monastic harmony. Hi, Filippo, <laughs> the youngest member of the group. Nice to see you there. <laughs> So today we're actually on parents and children. So this is for you and your dad, <laughs> parents and children. And um, I just read through this briefly and I have to give the first caveat, which is that uh, this is a principle to be uh, um, taken on board in whatever way it can help you. And also recognizing that not everybody has good relationships with their family, their parents. There can be quite some difficult relationships, sometimes some trauma there. So this is not a kind of pressure for us to feel things we don't feel, but this is the sort of ideal situation and it's something we can aspire to perhaps. And I also think that because of that, you know, it can be a general principle that we apply to the relationships in our life, even if they're not our birth parents. Sometimes we have wise elders in our life or we have people that are like parents to us somehow or, or just people we respect maybe friends wiser older maybe same age who knows um, but people who've done a great deal for us and looked after us with tender care and this is how um, we can reflect in that way so the first little um, passage is from the Anguttu Nikaya number four and it carries on with Anguttu number two and I'll just read through it. There might not be a lot of discussion around it. I really don't know. But these are discussion groups rather than classes. So I'm not going to add a whole lot to it. But I would love to hear um, any questions or thoughts you might have. And also um, any difficulties that come up in relation to this. And perhaps how we can work through some of those. Applying the Dhamma to the relationships we do have. Yeah. So this is called Parents and Children, and Parents are of Great Help. And usually I change the word monks for monastics to make it gender inclusive. Sometimes also you can just read that word as community because it was probably speaking to all the different members of the fourfold assembly. So I'll say community right now because most of us are not monastics. Community. Those families dwell with Brahma, and Brahma was one of the gods in uh, Hindu mythology, but even in uh, Buddhist cosmology as well, uh, a being from the godly realms. Those families dwell with Brahma, where at home the parents are respected by their children. Those families dwell with the ancient teachers, where at home the parents are respected by their children. Those families dwell with the ancient deities, where at home the parents are respected by the children. Those families dwell with the holy ones, where at home the parents are respected by the children. Brahma community is a term for mother and father. The ancient teachers is a term for mother and father. The ancient deities is a term for father and mother. The holy ones is a term for father and mother. And why? Parents are of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. <laughs> is that true, Filippo? Your daddy brings you up and feeds you and shows you the world, beautiful things in the world. 
even maybe ugly things sometimes, but always feeling safe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly he's feeding you. I know that because you're growing up really nicely. <laughs> okay. So one little thought that did pop up while I was reading this is um, we're talking about a situation, actually, aren't we? A situation of the family life at home. It's not necessarily saying that the children should respect the parents. Of course, it's wonderful in the sort of situation that we can do that and we can recognise what they've done for us. But it's almost as though they're saying that uh, um, we dwell in the presence of those gods or, you know, in the presence of teachers, etc., where the whole situation lends itself to that respect, right? And you can see how it could be the very opposite. It could be a hell realm if that were not the case. You know, some families, it's, it's anything but the heavenly realm. And also, I think it is pointing us to the fact that, you know, whatever upbringing we may think we've had, can we be grateful for the fact that we're alive, the fact that we have this opportunity to live as a human being who has had enough food and enough care to make it to the age we are, and also to come in contact with the Dhamma? And I think for me anyway, it's easier to have that gratitude. And my parents were basically really good parents. But of course, we had our difficulties. And there are certain things in my psychology that perhaps were influenced by certain difficulties that were there. But uh, in a sense, we can use all of that within reason for our spiritual path. And I'm sure I wouldn't have had the opportunities to come in contact with the Dhamma if I hadn't at least been educated in a way that, you know, caused me to question or to use my analytical mind, for example, or to feel, um, yeah, taken care of enough to have that privilege, right? Otherwise, we're kind of just focused on survival. Mm. So I don't know if that brings up anything for anyone else, but please, at any time, Raise your virtual hand or type in the chat and I'll read any comments out. Otherwise, I'll continue the next passage, which um, again talks about gratitude to parents. So the last one was more around respect. So this is called repaying one's parents. I'll say monastics this time. So monastics, I declare that there are two persons that are not easily repaid. What two? one's mother and father this can also relate to one's mother and mother right if it's a gay couple or a father and father or whatever other combination of elders are in the family raising the child even if one should carry about one's mother on one's shoulder and one and one's father on the other and while doing so should live a hundred years reach the age of a hundred years and one should attend to them by anointing them with balms, by massaging, bathing, and rubbing their limbs. And they should even void their excrements there. Even by that, one would not do enough for one's parents, nor would one repay them. Even if one were to establish one's parents as the supreme lords and rulers over this earth, so rich in the seven treasures, one would not do enough for them, nor, one would, nor would one repay them. For what reason? Parents are of great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them to the world. But one who encourages their unbelieving parents settles and establishes them in faith. One who encourages their immortal parents settles and establishes them in moral virtue. Immoral, sorry, not immortal. Oh, how about immortal parents? Immoral parents. This is with my glasses. <laughs> Settles and establishes them in moral virtue. He encourages their miserly parents. Settles and establishes them in generosity. He encourages their ignorant or delusional parents. Settles and establishes them in wisdom. Such a one does enough for their parents they repay them and more than repay them for what they've done hmm. it's a kind of a happy ending isn't it 
I think that's beautiful, actually, in the sense that it's at least sort of suggesting that sometimes children actually have something to teach their parents. So there is that respect, but it also goes both ways. And uh, our greatest, the greatest way we can repay them and show them our gratitude is to actually encourage in them qualities they can take into, obviously, this life, but even beyond. And these are the real gems, aren't they? I mean, whatever else we do for parents, even if we look after them, clean them, it says even if they, we make them supreme lords and rulers over the earth, so rich in the seven treasures, which I don't know what they are, but if we can help establish our parents in more faith, and that means here confidence in the Buddha's teachings or confidence in uh, goodness, really, essentially, confidence in truth, right? who encourages them in moral virtue. Remember, it only says encourages. Oh, encourages, settles, and establishes. This is ideal, but we can do part of that. Mm. Encourages the miserly parents and settles and establishes them in generosity. So we can just encourage them that way. Encourages the delusional parents. I say delusional because ignorance is usually more related to education or knowledge, whereas delusion is more related to an absence of wisdom to seeing things in ways that are not in line with Dhamma and settles and establishes them in wisdom, then one does enough. They repay them more than repay them for what they've done. It makes me very happy because sometimes we think when we go on the spiritual path that our families might reject us or might think we're a bit strange or wasting our time why aren't you going on to your next degree or <laughs> you know why aren't you kind of having grandchildren for me <laughs> but uh my parents might have felt some of that but now slowly slowly they start to listen to the dhamma and this is after 28 years of practice on my part but slowly, slowly, they actually come of their own accord sometimes to mm -hmm. some of my teachers' Dhamma talks. I think sometimes they sneak a peeky, even at mine, but that's a bit more weird, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not really up to us to... <laughs> I think it's harder, right, to um, see your child in a different light and to take advice sometimes from someone you brought up. But when they mm -hmm. see you associating with good people, they get interested mm -hmm. and... Uh, Venerable mm. Pekka was saying yesterday, your mom is your biggest fan. I said, really? <laughs> I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, look at what she's writing. She's following your newsletters. She's, she's really on top of it. And, and that wasn't the case, you know, several years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to come to Kilaya and ask you to unmute. I was wondering whether you thought... Um the the attempt to do these things has value in terms of what the sutta is saying or, or is it an all or nothing thing i mean i would like to think that the attempt to convince my parents to um look at life with faith and be generous and act morally consistently would be enough but my experience has been that after living with my parents for about 15 years now and talking to them continuously about the Dhamma, uh, they listen, but when they act, they don't consider what we've talked about, or they don't ask for my advice on, <laughs> any, on any of these issues. Yeah. And even though I try and remind them and try and um, give examples of how these things could be applied in life. Um, it seems like it would be easier to carry, carry them around on my shoulder for under <laughs> uh, in terms easier of easier but less beneficial. <laughs> yes, yes, definitely. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I wonder. I just wanted, would love to hear your opinion yeah. on the language of the sutta. Yeah. Is it, is there an intermediary ground yeah. that it's giving yeah. us credit for, or right. is it really like we have to actually leave our parents with some real faith and with some impetus uh -huh. to be generous on their own and right. to consider morality on yeah, their yeah, own yeah, yeah, yeah. and to, you know, have some real wisdom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are all big, big, uh, big accomplishments, you know, to do with sure. anyone. Good, good question. And I'm sure 
probably the question many people are actually thinking to themselves right now. I would say absolutely yes. Um, one thing I would just point out is that he's not saying convince our parents. I just noticed that language because I, I came at it a little bit like that in the beginning, right? Got to convince them. It says encourage. And I think that's very different. It's almost the difference. It could be seen sometimes as the difference between seeing a lack in them or seeing a lack in their knowledge and trying to fill that. Whereas encourage, encourage could be seeing what they're already doing and encouraging it. That's one way I could see the difference. Like maybe point out what they are doing and ask them more about how they feel when they do those things. You know, when they are kind or when they are considerate and you say, wow, that was such a good thing. Did you think about that? Did it feel good? You know, encouraging is different, I think, from convincing. Mm. Um, secondly, um, I think that one way to, uh, the most effective way, actually, to give them an interest and a confidence in the teachings and in virtue and in wisdom is to live those things yourself, to practice those things yourself so that they see a change over time. And they might not necessarily notice, know what it is or label it as virtue, or, but if they see that you're increasing in happiness and that you're moving away from unwholesome pursuits, then they might start to get interested and think, oh, he's got something. She's got something, you know. Maybe this stuff they're doing, sitting on the cushion, whatever they do, going in their mind, trying to quieten their mind or watch their breath, maybe there's something to it. Thirdly, Sometimes what I notice is that if you just stay with it, after a while they think, oh, there must be something to it because they're not giving it up. They're still practicing after all these years. <laughs> they're not going to give it up. So that in itself speaks a lot. But lastly, I think, and maybe the most important point in your question is that uh, the path is always a path of intention. It's always a path of planting seeds, right? There's so much we can do in terms of giving people uh, inspiration, uh, offering teachings, trying to explain those teachings or show people the way. But we can't make those people ripen any quicker than they're able to do, right? We can only really lay the groundwork, lay the conditions or influence those conditions in a positive way so that our parents might actually um, come on board, you know? I mean, in my case, I guess... You know, it's little things like writing stories in the newsletter. I mean, it's little things over time and they get interested. Like even if there's a story from someone else, you know, a young woman or an older person or someone they can relate to or not maybe and how it affects their life, then they're interested because it's one step removed from me. It's not just me trying to make my parents how I want them. It's something much broader than that. But I think they have to come to it when the in their own time and there's a very fine line isn't there between getting preachy and giving them the impression that you're better than them in a sense and I'm not saying you are but I think in my case definitely when I got back from Asia there was a bit of a sense of oh maybe she thinks she's sort of better than us we have quite a boring life and she's been all over the place and I'm sure I would just rave on about everything I'd done and seen and maybe not very tactfully you know sometimes <laughs> so um <clears throat> Yeah, to encourage, I think, really is to to get them hooked on it a bit, you know, to get them to see there's something beautiful here. It's helped you. It's helped uh, you live more happily. It's helped make you even maybe more humble, more grateful for them, maybe more able to see the good in them that's already there. And that can be an encouragement. So anyway, seems like a long answer, but hopefully there's some thoughts there. Um, it's never black or white. It's not like if they aren't completely strong in virtue or wisdom that you haven't repaid your debt, you've done your best, right? You've done your best. And we're probably not going to repay all our debts in this life unless we're fully enlightened, right? But that's not the point. It's a process. So everything counts. Everything is a, is a way of expressing our care and our compassion for our parents. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? I don't know, because it's probably a question many people or thought that many people might have had. Um, 
or any experiences people have had. I think I have to say because uh, there are people coming to my community now who, you know, do think about the idea of ordaining simply because there's an opportunity, right? And I know some of you in the group are thinking that way and wonder what are my parents going to think about it. But according to this sutta, that is likely you know if the best way to repay your parents is to encourage them in those things then actually ordaining or following the path seriously would be a way to do that because even the fact they get interested in what you're doing a little bit or even the fact that they start to meet other meditators is already helping them get exposed to the dhamma what parents think is in their best interest is is not necessarily so <laughs> right Okay, I'm coming to Benjamin. I think Manumi was there. Oh, was she? Was Manumi wanting to speak? No. Oh, no. Sorry, Benjamin. I think I asked you to unmute and then muted you again. Are you able to do it now or shall I send you another message? Yeah. Hello. Hi. Uh, so I had a couple of little thoughts on a similar vein. Um, my own experience is I have one parent who is very wise very moral, very interested in developing herself. And then the other parent, completely the opposite. And I was kind of thinking, all my life I've kind of tried to help my father by example. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't seem to have any effect uh, going on 30 years of doing it now. Yeah, And I was sort of trying to gauge how do you decide where to invest your time? Because there are other people I could engage with and they'd be much more receptive to changing their behaviors. Mm. And it's not like I'm trying to convert him to Buddhism or anything. Right. I'm just trying to encourage him to maybe, you know, try sobriety on occasion. Yeah. <laughs> Things like that. Yeah, um, yeah. But he's very, very uh, stuck, really, in what he's mm -hmm. doing. And I'm wondering. Is there a point when it's better just to cut your losses and invest your energies elsewhere? Mm. And then I had another quick comment on this, which I thought was maybe worth saying, which is apart from possibly the sentence about faith, I thought it's noteworthy that none of this uh, that the Buddha is encouraging us to do for our parents is a, specifically about Buddhism. It's yeah. not try to get your parents to be Buddhist. It's right. get your parents moving in a more moral more yeah beneficial direction which i think is uh always worth remembering yes beautiful yeah absolutely i mean did the buddha ever think in terms of buddhism i very much doubt it he taught the eightfold path right there was a path and that included morality virtue that included wisdom it wasn't called buddhism until later on all this idea of ism can sometimes be too much too close to identity really too close to religion for me anyway <laughs> i mean you might think that's weird as a buddhist nun but it's only called a buddhist nun yeah actually we were the samanas there were the householders and there were the samanas in the buddha's day and the samanas could be of any uh, sect right we were the samanas of Gautama the buddha <laughs> but we were still samanas we were recluses we were yeah so that's a very good point and um i don't know if that even might relate to the first one the first question you asked in a sense like if wisdom if establishing your father in wisdom could be related to just trying to establish him in something that is uh more beneficial for him and i don't know i mean i think encouragement might not be enough if it's an addiction there it might be more the case that the compassion and the patience and the companionship in a way the the compassion really and the sense of accepting him as he is might be the starting point for the change. I don't know, but it's complicated. And I guess this is something very personal for everyone to have to ask. Um, I mean, certainly, I think if it's tipping into the point where it, it really depletes you and it causes, you know, a sense of empathetic distress or, you know, burnout in some way, then the priority at that time is you it's self-compassion for you you know and that might entail being around other people a lot of the time and giving your energy to other people a lot of the time but then perhaps sometimes also giving that kind compassionate ear to your dad if he's willing to 
have it <laughs> if he's will, you know if he's able to speak and to to share how he feels i don't know how close you are and whether that's even safe or you know uh, yeah healthy for you to do it but i guess that's what you'd have to ask i think there's the buddha never expected us to sacrifice our own well-being for others you know and he said out of three people the best is the one who think who practices for the sake of themselves and others the second best is who practices for the sake of themselves only and the worst is those who practice only for others which is rather sobering actually because a lot of people practice only for others or help only others and forget all about themselves so it's a delicate one and I think there's never a wrong or right I mean Buddhism is not a religion or it's not a religion okay <laughs> but the path is not a kind of punishing path it's not that you know if you're unable to help somebody who's just not ready to be helped that that is somehow bad for you no because you've tried you know and that's where our goodness lies i personally think i don't know what others might have to say any thoughts well yeah you know there are, oh, yeah well, there are all brahma viharas mm. not just one mm. oh hello that would be unique yeah, double beanie. <laughs> um, yeah, there's four Brahma Viharas, not just one, and it, and Upekka is one of mm. them. So we think that we should always be a metta, whatever it is. But uh, sometimes, yeah, what we the practice is of uh, equanimity. Mm. Yeah, yeah, or or compassion. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 And sometimes equanimity means accepting that you've done what you can, you know, uh, you care. It's not that you don't care, but that person has to follow their own karma. There's only so much you can do. Uh, yeah. Any thoughts from here? Yes. Chi. A new question? Sure. Another question. Uh, so growing up, I was definitely one of those people who always noticed um, the areas my parents collect in. Maybe I have, you know, I have some idea about what parents should be doing or should not be doing, that kind of thing. And um, when I came across somebody who I thought was fulfilling that duty, I felt, you know, I, I still do feel a sense of gratitude towards them, almost like a you've done what my parents haven't done, so I should also repay you the same way. Mm. I would repay my parents for that. But then I don't know if that's too extreme of an approach, if it's too actually hard on my parents, or if, even if they haven't done those things, I should still um, hold them up higher than other people, let's say. Mm. That's a really good question. I guess in this sort of my sense is that we're specifically directing gratitude and respect to the parents for giving us a human life, mm -hmm. like specifically for those things they're talking about here. Um, what does it say it's about... Like, um, great as they brought you to the world. Hmm? You bring, they bring you up, feed you. Yeah. Great help to their children. They bring them up, feed them, and show them the world. So the actual fact that they brought us up and fed us is it already a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a specific kind of gratitude to the people who did that, which may or may not be our birth parents. Mm -hmm. But the, I don't think that necessarily means that you can't give just as much gratitude and um, care and attention to other people too that had certain qualities your parents didn't because you never have too much goodness you can never have too much gratitude mm -hmm. it's not that that takes away from the gratitude you have for your parents but it might be just gratitude for different reasons in some way mm -hmm. and maybe then we can even go beyond individuals sometimes and just have gratitude in general that all these things were present in our lives you know our parents gave one thing someone else gave something else and mm -hmm. gratitude for everything we've received because i think mm -hmm. really in the buddhist path it's about the qualities we develop it's not about the recipient so much i mean they may receive it they may not receive it you know we can do with all our heart we can try to um tend to our parents care for them establish them in virtue etc but they might not be able to accept that 
But the point is we don't, we enrich our own heart and mind through that practice. So um, I don't know if that really answers it, but I don't think one negates the other. I think, yeah, just just see if you can develop them towards all your elders and people who've helped you in your life. And when it says show the world, is, is, is the... Uh, show them the world yeah what, what does this mean yeah good question what does it mean to bring them up feed them and show them the world I guess it's like to me it's sort of like remembering that your parents kind of took you out and sh maybe it's like taught you language in a way it's like here's a little flower here's a duck you know let's feed the ducks and mm -hmm. here are the, some people that could be your friends and maybe here are some people that you don't want to be friends with um they orient you into the world, you know, because we wouldn't have a clue what was going on otherwise. Actually, if we were alone, we wouldn't know your, what was happening. Your, well, your parents are from where you get your values from, isn't mm. it? What kind <clears> of um, <throat> food do you, from, from, from simple things like that to type of music you like to listen to, the type of people you like to hang out with, your political interests, all of that, you, I mean... I basically like what my parents like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, isn't it? They, well, like they give you a certain angle from a very early age, which you can't help but be brainwashed by. It for me is a bit of much of that because my mom, mm. uh, she wasn't too much stuff when I was younger. It was mostly my brothers. So, <laughs> and they're very different from her in some ways. Yeah. So I'm not different from her, so uh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, am I to, because I thought they also really, really oriented me to the world. So, yeah, yeah just uh, I guess trying to figure out if yeah. it's... Um, yeah. yeah, it's interesting because I think, show you the world I think to me that sort of I imagine that as a child like as a baby almost just seeing the world for the first time and I find it interesting that don't go beyond that because I think the Buddha's not saying we should follow the same values our parents had not at all that might be included in how they show us the world but I think it's almost like their duties are done at that point and then we go into the world and follow our values I think that's kind of the aim I mean the Buddha was never saying just do things because your family did it or because tradition tells you to do it or even because your elders tell you always work out is this really for the good and benefit of myself and others and so the path is very much an exploration but of course we wouldn't have the chance to do that if we hadn't been brought up and fed and oriented mm -hmm. at least in the beginning so show yeah, it sounds like uh, showing you the world is actually just uh, not not to read too much into it. It's just don't think so, no. Yeah. But uh, whatever it really means to you in a good way. I think mm -hmm. when things are done for me anyway, when things are a little bit obscure or confusing, I just let them aside for a while. Mm -hmm. And if they make sense in a way that kind of leads to the wholesome states and leads to deepening my practice, then then I pick them up but otherwise it's like okay maybe there's some meaning there but maybe it'll become clearer later I read that just as showing you around like because you can't go anywhere as a little one can you they hold your hand and they take you outside and I don't know I'll just read a question in the chat we can come back to this if it's interesting but um I'll read from the chat was the idea of filial Filial piety around in Buddha's time. I found this idea to be quite problematic sometimes, which em emphasizes absolute obedience. Oh, gosh. I'm not sure I even know what it really means. Filial piety. Is that like, um, what is that actually? Respect for the parents, parents yeah? Yeah. Probably like kind of having. Degrees of it. Um, taken to quite problematic which emphasizes absolute obedience i don't yeah. think obedience that's a funny one isn't it because the difference between benjamin saying like it can mean obedience or service and it's in confucianism that it's a big deal which is very interesting because i felt in a particular monastery i was in where which was definitely influenced by confucianism there was a lot of expectation for obedience and to me that felt very, very different from buddhist 
ideology, actually, because in the Sangha, according to the Vinaya, we're supposed to run along democratic principles and, and actually respect and elders are seen more in terms of their ordination age than their actual uh, physical age. So it's not that because somebody is older, they are necessarily the wisest or even that they're the ones we should follow. It's actually according to your ordination. And even then, if somebody at the head of the Sangha who's senior is off track, they can be outvoted by the rest of the Sangha. Ideally, they'll be in that role because they've been asked to be in that role by someone who has confidence in them and they're fit for that role, right? But they're not infallible. <laughs> and we're always meant to question and, and scrutinize our teachers. So, yeah, I think if it's translated as obedience to parents, it's probably encouraged to be fairly respectful and obedient to good parents. <laughs> as in we use our wisdom. If it's translated as service to parents, I think that's very different. Service is a beautiful thing. Service means giving of yourself, giving of your time in a way that's actually um, resonant with the needs of those people. So it's it's very different. Okay, so you're explaining further. It's a Confucianist concept, very popular in East Asian countries. Yeah, I feel there's a tension personally between some East Asian um, approaches to and I've only seen this in monasteries because I haven't got I haven't actually I've lived in Hong Kong and Myanmar actually as well for four years so I have had a bit of exposure yeah actually I lived in Hong Kong for six months not that long um it felt very different from India very different Indians they debate they <laughs> fight it out they have their opinions um in Myanmar it didn't feel that way Partly it could have been the military dictatorship and the education system that hadn't educated people to really, um, it, it wasn't a democracy, right? So uh, partly it could be the culture, yeah. It did feel quite different. So I don't know. What does Venerable Upeka think? I mean, different thing is we all answer from our own cultural perspectives as well on this. <laughs> but according to how I understand the Vinaya, it's a lot more democratic than many people would have you believe. And, you know, when you see how it's understood in Thailand, for example, is very hierarchical compared to when it's practiced by, say, scholars in the West. It's really a different ball game altogether. You know, we take the early suttas and the Vinaya as a guide rather than our elders necessarily. We question the elders against the Buddha's teaching. So the teacher is not the ultimate source. The Buddha, we go back to the Buddha. And I think that's very present for the Bhikkhuni Sangha because we're, we don't have so many elders, we don't have so many teachers in our lineage. And so we we hark back more to the, to the suttas in many ways. So someone else is saying, I think it was considered virtuous in the Buddha society to respect one's parents to an extreme. <laughs> well, I suppose extreme is a very subjective word. I mean, the Buddha did say he taught the middle way, so I'm not sure <laughs> if he would say, we might feel it's extreme, but I I mean, there are many other suttas in here. It's a shame I hadn't really got them at my fingertips like a, a really brilliant scholar. There are places in the suttas that it says not to just respect people because of their kind of status or, or um, relationship in your life, but to... Uh, give respect where respect's due in many ways. Uh, another really nice um, sutta that we did earlier on in here under right speech, I think, proper speech, was that um, we should praise what's worthy of praise, not praise what's not worthy of praise, and we should blame or not not praise what's not worthy of praise, right? Or blame what's blameworthy. And to praise what's blameworthy is actually, it actually says you go to hell. Okay, in this particular sort of look back through the book. I'm, I know it's in the book somewhere. I think it's under the speech section. And I found that very interesting because that to me elevates wisdom above anything like obedience. And I think that is the Buddha's path. I think, you know, from right view onwards, we're supposed to use our discernment, our wisdom. Can I make a yeah, sure. I was also thinking it sounds quite extreme. Uh, they gave you birth and they fed you. But then I thought, actually, 
when I've had to look after children, they're very, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> and they've done that maybe at least for four years for you to be an adult now. Um, <laughs> they cry all the time since <laughs> they're born. You have to feed them, you have to keep yeah. catching them, you have to keep rocking them. Sometimes they're up all night. Maybe it's like until we're in that, we don't know, yeah. you know. But I don't remember any of this. Right, we don't remember yeah. it. Good point. And I think, again, all these points are not because there's necessarily anything inherently marvellous. I mean, there is, I'm sure. Everyone has great qualities. But it's not to revere people so. outside. It's to bring up qualities in ourselves. It's just mm. to have that. I mean, I think it's interesting. It brings up this mm. sort of, it is a slight tension that it can bring up for mm. everyone, I would say, that hasn't had ideal parents, which is everyone, right? Isn't mm. it? Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. there are no perfect people. Not even Buddhas are perfect. That's not the point, right? There's no perfect person. Um, yeah. I mean, in the sense he was pure, like he didn't have greed, hate, delusion, but still... There were people that were very upset by him and that actually hated him, wanted to kill him, you know. So, or people that he just did couldn't help. So in that sense, mm. you know, no matter how virtuous you are, you're going to upset people. <laughs> but I think it's all about, like, can we just see things from a slightly different angle that we maybe haven't looked at before? Yeah, please. Yeah, I think I was going to... I was yeah. thinking that, um, I, like the what came to my mind was it kind of it helps us reframe mm. yeah. our mm. lives in a kind of more. In a, yeah. That helps us. Yeah, it helps us. Yeah. Reframe yeah. our lives maybe in a more realistic way. Yeah. Because like you say, you don't know, right, until, because we don't remember. Well, and then it reminds yeah. us that we, we don't, don't remember. remember. We don't remember. Yeah. yeah. Screaming and shouting yeah. all the yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> did you want to say something oh no, no. oh okay I'll, I'll keep reading from the chat because um it's carrying on on the same lines here uh the line ancient deities is a term for father and mother from the sutta reminded me of that okay reminded you of the mm, yeah i wonder about the translation as well because this is obviously you know a translation of the pali but it's quite interesting yeah yeah, I can see where that might resonate with sort of uh, East Asian culture, ancient deities. And he might have been picking these things up from the society at that time. So it might have been picked up from the Brahmanical traditions. Um, and he was kind of reframing. He often used to use the language of the Brahmanical traditions, but reframe it in a different way. So it was almost like improving on it <laughs> in a sense so instead of looking at your deities and asking them and repaying them and giving them food and all the rest mm. what about care for your parents wipe up their excrement you know <laughs> help them to become more moral and virtuous it was very grounded I think that's another reason he's using that term still that way in India to this day much more so than the west yeah true and many Asian cultures the parents are commonly mentioned and considered divine within india i mean yeah within the culture is one thing um the pulley is more respect on the whole actually but i don't know that most people really think their parents are divine i don't know do you ever think that you're sri lankan it can't be, <laughs> it can't be she says <laughs> In the respect, to the, it is the respect to the elders or parents. In Sri Lanka, we bend down and worship the parents the same way we do as monastics, right? But do you feel it? You do feel it. But not everyone would feel it. Would they? We can't speak for everyone, obviously. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah, so... um. I feel I feel this is kind of a generalized and so I mean this is for good parents obviously and like that you know you you assume that normally the parents bring up children and you you try to do the best that you know mm -hmm. I mean it you know the, the way I have brought my children I've done my best but that is not maybe not the perfect universal best and so all the parents are doing their best mm -hmm. and you know sometimes yeah. they have their problems and then you get neglected and but they've 
tried their best. Mm. And I mean, there are there is a minority who wouldn't try their best, who would neglect, who would abuse. But I, I feel this book doesn't talk about those. This is the generalized thing. So we need to understand, okay, my parent is not like that, but... um. You know, but then I would, you know, look at another. So as uh, Venerable Upeka said, we can practice equanimity, equanimity yeah. on them. And on Sri Lankan thing, uh, when I was a teenager, it was um, and so annoying. You go to this um, annual New Year thing and you have to, oh, this is your um, grandfather's uncle, this one's that one. And then you have to bow and, you know, <laughs> it is like crazy and you hate the day. <laughs> but then you slowly realize that this is a community and you yeah. respect each other and you learn from different things, you mm -hmm. know, them and they teach you. And that is how they kind of culturally mm -hmm. build it up. Um, so yeah. I think that is how it was built it up. Beautiful. I mean, even just speaking about that, we were speaking something similar at tea time and it brings up joy because, I mean, I could easily fall, you know, find fault with my parents, my family, because there wasn't an outlet. There wasn't anyone else there. But if I would have been able to have a break with some aunties or some grandparents, which I didn't have because my grandparents died young, I didn't have any. Mm, I had one uncle who we never saw and that was it. <laughs> and no cousin. And oh gosh, I was desperate for just a different perspective, you know, and I think if we can like, yeah, just see this as elders and everyone has something and everyone tries their best. And that was kind of, you know, a, a, probably a large part of everyone's healing with parents is when you grow up and you realize, gosh, you know, they were like 27. Mm -hmm. They were, <laughs> of course, to me, they looked ancient and wise and, you know, parents have that sense of authority about them. And sometimes they can be quite authoritative. But my goodness, they're in their 20s. I mean, they mm -hmm. hadn't been to parent training school. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one would be qualified to train parents anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like you say, everyone has their strengths and weaknesses. So, yeah, I think that's really beautiful if we can um, have that perspective that everyone is conditioned, right? This is the understanding mm -hmm. of non-self. We're all conditioned. We all have mm -hmm. strengths and weaknesses. And really, mm -hmm. the idea is that we do our best and... Um, I'm sure most people do love their parents, actually. Maybe we don't use the word respect very much, but I think it's quite close. Um, and maybe it's an invitation for us to bring up a, a kind of more objective reflection on who they are and their qualities and see if what there is there to respect. Because we can find stuff to respect in almost anyone. Mm. Ideally, anyone, but sometimes it's, you have to say almost anyone. Because mm. <laughs> sometimes the conditioning so strongly to the negative at that time, it obscures anything else. Um, I'll keep reading a little bit, but quite quickly, because I'm sure there'll be other subjects people want to discuss. The same extreme respect to elders and parents is also quite prominent in Greece, where I'm coming from. And this is from Nikos. Okay. They are more authority figures, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess there's a certain respect that's due just by the fact that people have been through life. They've been through more than we have, right? But then that also can be very annoying if they sort of come across as knowing everything and telling you don't do it because I say so or don't do it because I did and it didn't work for me. I mean, that just made me want to say, well, let me try it for myself, please. Mm. So <laughs> that's also quite tricky, isn't it, if, um, you know, people are really authoritative it can send us the other direction <laughs> I don't know maybe that's my rebellious nature I've been studying connections and similarities between the ancient Greek traditions and the Indian ones okay these are chats between people I think yes I've heard recently that in the time of the Buddha there were Greek Buddhist Sangha but I've never been taught that at school interesting isn't it because um yeah there's a whole story around that about how probably the the teachings spread over to Egypt first of all probably and probably Greece and Greece is the first place that the Buddha was actually depicted there from the Gandharan uh, era we just wrote about that in the newsletter like which century was that first to seventh First to seventh AD, not a way. It's quite odd, isn't it? And they were the first depictions of the Buddha. But yeah, there were also people in ancient uh, Egypt that were apparently um, basically dressed just like monks and nuns and had a teacher called Ammonius Saka, which is a little bit mm. like Sakyamoni, <laughs> but the other way around. Mm. 
Sergeant yeah. Brown's big story. You yeah. can look it up and he tells this story. It's very interesting. Alexandria, that's where they went. Mm. Isn't Melinda Pania? It is Greek. He was Melinda Pania, isn't it? I don't know. Melinda Pan Panna. I don't know. Let's not get too dis uh too uh <clears throat> sidetracked. <laughs> Praise blame Sutta Venerable referred to is page 80 if anyone's looking for it. Anger to a five, two, three, six, great. Okay. And someone has to leave, but it was heartwarming. Thanks so much, Meta. Wonderful weekend. Okay. If you have left, oh, you've not left. Welcome. Thank you for coming. And feel free to pop out anytime. That's for anyone too. Uh, it's obviously lovely if you can stay, but lovely to see you. Hope to see you another time. So, uh, yeah. Anything else people would like to share, or we can carry on with another paragraph? Or anything else from the room right now? I don't know. Would you like to say something? You also have, you're from Hong Kong, so <laughs> you must have a particular perspective on this too. Yes, I think I think culture is very much different than you know, religion. I mean, why do we have you know, Buddhism in Burma and Sri Lanka and mm. Indonesia and China, Thailand? Is that they've been incorporated with the the culture, mm. and where the culture has shaped that mm. role to, you know, mm. religions. Mm. Um, still, I think it, as long as the principle is most important, mm. <laughs> loving kindness and um, yeah. um, being more conscious about you know what we're doing and. That is a basic, mm. very important thing. Mm. Uh, but I think the <clears throat> the uh, Buddhism in China has been combined, uh, integrated the with Confucian, Confucianism and, yeah. Yeah. and Taoism. And filial piety. Yeah. Yeah. Taoism, three yeah. things. Mm. So, you know, Taoism is about um, very similar to um, <clears throat> yoga. Mm -hmm. They talk about breath and physical and mm physics, how to maintain your physics and want to maintain a long life. And um, Confucian is very, at that time, is cooperate with like here. Uh, that's how the king represents the god, isn't it? The, right. the Vatican now is okay, the pope, yeah. yeah, represent yeah. the god. Mm -hmm. So the king are representing the heaven. Right, the God. right, 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 right. So, uh, <clears throat> and your people, you have to worship the God. So, therefore, you worship the God. So, you worship the the King. Yeah. So, it's a very hierarchy society. Yeah. And in order to um, maintain that kind of hierarchy, make you know, at the time, which is they think is suitable for them, so that uh, the society, the country, can be living harmony. Right, they right, harmony. right. So parents, because they give birth to children, and therefore yeah. they are the they are the number one. And whatever they say, the parents say it can't be wrong, which I totally uh, reject that. Because, right, uh, right. But at the time, that's what they. Think. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned yes. the harmony and about how it's a way to organize society, right, mm. in a way that keeps everyone on the same page, mm. in a sense. Because the whole book, remember, is about social and communal harmony. So, mm. you know, if we read these suttas in a way that, you know, presuming mm. that we're aiming to establish more harmony mm. in our own communities mm. and societies, mm. then it takes on a different meaning because it's not even necessarily that we're right or wrong mm. about respecting someone mm. or not, right? Mm. We can find something there. Mm. But it's mm. more about these qualities that we develop are going to conduce to like a feeling mm. of well-being. And I think also mm. we have to presume nobody's perfect, but if we encourage a person for the good that we do see in them, they're more likely to live up to that. And that's one of Arjun Brown's ways of training his monastics. He presumes that you're very honest, very dedicated and sincere. He said to me many times, you have my trust and respect. He says it automatically when it's just a given, right? It's just a given that he has that for everyone. And you have to do quite a lot to actually destroy it. I think it's almost impossible. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing and you know that method of training people tends to bring out the best in them and it tends to cause you to just feel so grateful and also see that beauty in yourself and then live up to it you know want to cultivate it want to do him proud so to speak I mean that's really what's behind this whole project is like my feeling of gratitude to someone who really believes in me 
yeah, always has and won't shake that belief. I can go to him in any mood and he'll still tell me, I'm not worried about you. You have my trust and respect. But in sincerity, you know, I mean, these aren't just words. It's like it's it's deeply touching. It's deeply, deeply touching when when someone relates to you like that. So perhaps this is also to bring out the best in everyone. Mm. Right. Actually, um, instead I, of fault finding, I hear a Buddhist story. See, <clears throat> um, religion um, is talking about uh, make people worship heaven and hate the hell, mm. and always right and wrong. But in reality, Buddhism is not like that. It's no right and wrong. It's your view. Your view is the perception, the way you see things. Mm. Ultimately is to bring our view this back to yeah. the mantra and and the person right. and how we're going to you know reduce yeah. our emotion get yeah. rid of reducing mm-hmm. say, get exactly rid, reducing the five hindrances so yep. we can see clear we are not those books are not tell us to follow it it's to us to able to be discriminate Sad, yeah? sad, sad. so it's a discrimination the body wants us to develop yeah and that discrimination on one has to do is to uh, always stay in the middle, mm. not falling left and right, four and five. Mm. Uh, maintain that observation of ourselves, mm. that level of mm. raise up that, you know, uh, yeah, perception good that you uh, mm-hmm. bring a better picture, yeah. like a tapestry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are doing our condition, and therefore you produce mm. a yeah. more, um, you know, um, Pasadi, what they call it, isn't yeah. it? More, Conscious, yeah, yeah, conscious result so that we can interpret it more in line with human being, mm. uh, involve that, mm. our, yeah. you know, consciousness, and, yeah, you know, more harmony, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. So, I mean, so many times we um talk about that here, you know, that it's mm. not about this kind of binary good bad, yeah. but it's about helping the wholesome quality yeah. whatever perception whatever view can yeah. help the wholesome qualities mm. to increase mm. and the unwholesome ones to decrease mm. yeah in order to see yeah. clearly yeah. like you said that was perfect yeah yeah, yeah absolutely thank you yeah. yeah we have so much wisdom in this room it's yeah. fantastic and people from like three different continents no two different three different continents yeah anyway <laughs> that's really cool <laughs> more than that in the whole group <laughs> brilliant yeah so we're actually almost through I mean we could maybe I think it would be too late probably to start the next paragraph but we did uh, a lot of really wonderful thought-provoking stuff mm-hmm. I feel really inspired actually mm-hmm. I hope other people do as well um hopefully people who are parents feel a little bit of relief to know that mm-hmm. you deserve some respect mm-hmm. and uh you're not gonna get it right because you, you stick to that you know that uh, view you keep continue there's no end of it because our right. perception is different yeah that's so right there's someone else to do that we they want us he wants us to see it absolutely and that we can see mm. exactly what's happening. We you know, mm. yeah, what see what's happens. happening. Yeah, don't judge it, just see yeah. it. Yeah. And be happy ultimately. He wants us to be happy. Yes. And if you are we are engaging on that, we never have the mm. happiness, you know, right. because we are mind deluded. It just can yeah. you know, encourage us, mm. is that right or wrong? <laughs> Am I right? He's right, that kind yeah. of thing. Like, no peace. Mm. Yeah. That's not what they want yeah. us to do. Yeah. Wonderful. Mm. I hope you've all benefited from the conversation here too. We've got a mic that I hope is picking it up. Mm-hmm. But uh, mm-hmm. are there any less comments from the Zoom room before we uh, slowly, slowly wind up? Um, or anything that Renable and Pekka would like to say? <laughs> <laughs> I think her face says it all, but yeah, 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 yeah say something. No, no, honestly, I can't. No, I can't nothing. It's just very inspiring mm. what Han said as well. It's mm-hmm. about, in the end, about purifying, yeah. reducing the hindrances it's for it's ourselves. It's already anyway. Yeah. Keep saying, giving up, letting go. Right. If you keep bringing all this past, then your mind will be stay there and will have no room for you yeah, to have a clear dream. Truth. So that's, yeah. that's forget about it. Like mm. get on now. How do you yeah. make us happy? 
happy <laughs> and now we can blossom <laughs> all right let's get on with it <laughs> <laughs> i know some somebody has to get the clear to have, have to go first yeah. too, in order to get rid of the frustration okay. yes very good <laughs> so any 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 last thoughts from anyone here Maybe who is struggling with this or oh, still has confusion. <laughs> she said, drop, drop it. I just read his uh, you know, mindfulness. Uh, so you just drop it, cough in, put a nail on it. <laughs> That's what happened. Go right. forward. <laughs> you have us to be happy. <laughs> and comforted. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Okay, yeah. one more, <laughs> one more thing from Chi. Uh, I do catch myself sometimes wondering, uh, not not so much nowadays, but especially in the past, how did I end up in this family or with this parent specifically? Uh, is is there any, mm. you know, is there anything wholesome that can come from this kind of questions? Mm. Well, great actually, question uh, where, where can you go wrong with this right thing? right right that's a good one I mean <laughs> I think probably it's not going to help you to go very far with it at all actually um maybe it's okay to think that there might be reasons but that's about as far as it can really go because in a sense come as what we're making with the situation now and the danger with thinking oh did I get in this because of reasons is that if you're in a difficult situation, you might then start to think you deserve it, which is not the case. It's not a helpful perception. Um, and it's something that I found quite violent way to use the Buddhist doctrine, misuse the Buddhist doctrine, you know, to say, well, this is your karma, you just have to suffer it. You know, like Con said, we the Buddha wants us to be happy, so he wants us to use our mind in wholesome ways that actually bring up a sense of um, positivity and a sense of agency in a way, right? Like karma is something that's an action, it's something that's an intention, that's a response. So, I mean, the three right intentions are basically karma. It's where karma is made. It's whatever the situation, are we reacting to it with anger, with cruelty, with violence, with sense desire, or are we able to be gentle with it and have a feeling of letting go, forgiveness, acceptance, loving kindness. And that's a process, obviously, especially mm -hmm. if something's really, really difficult. But I don't think it's helpful to feel that, you know, something has happened to me because of some bad karma from the past. Mm -hmm. Other than if it's a sort of mild view that's a kind of mm, could be and if it helps you to accept it and then work with it. But otherwise, I think, I mean, the Buddha didn't go there when people asked about karma. He said it's just unfathomable. It's not really possible to relate one thing to another in a sequential way because we've had so many, many, many lives. I mean, I feel there's a sense that we may well have been connected to the people in our lives before. And sometimes you feel that, I think, more strongly with friends or with teachers than we do necessarily with our family. But... um yeah, at the same time, there might be something that's drawn us there. Yeah, maybe maybe um, there's only time for about two minutes. So maybe, okay, so I just, what the Buddha said to reflect on was to be grateful for being a human being, mm -hmm. to have the, your faculties, to have a mind that works. That's what you what you reflect on. Oh my God, I am a human being born with with a brain that generally functions generally <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay yeah. The last very minute. quickly yes um I totally agree with uh, you know um uh, very well mm -hmm. like, uh, but another thing is yes uh all those we got talk about karmic and karma happen we cannot control it it's already done already done and their connection is like community karmic uh, you know everything is related you know like mm -hmm. a web but what can we do now is this moment exactly we can do something yeah so let go of that yeah but this minute you can shift exactly. and you can be happy you can be very yeah. uh, joyful and healthy yeah this minute is your decision okay last <laughs> before you might not have that decision because you think everybody is everyone mm. is 
plan. Yeah. That's how you call these things. Already yeah. plan, everything is fixed mm. date, but this moment, now mm. you can have a choice. <laughs> okay, I'll tell I think that's that. the word to end on. Lovely. Yeah. This moment yeah. is your choice. Mm -hmm. So Manoe, would you like yeah, to? Yeah, thank you very much, Velvet, Achanda, and Velvet Pekka, both for all these valuable teachings. And thank you very much for all of you sharing and your wisdom and your, you know, ideas, which are so valuable, listening and sharing. I and mean, that is what, what brings this discussion. It's not a preaching thing. It's a discussion. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, the one thing I wanted to kind of remind you um, is that, you know, that we're all getting ready for the completion of the new monastery and the big move. And there are some exciting events like the mini Buddha statue project and the upcoming events of Ajahn Brahmali tours. And uh, there's talks as well as Ajahn Brahm's online retreat. So please check the details in the latest newsletter and the website. The events page has all those things and you can book them and uh, see where you want to kind of go and listen to Ajahn Brahmali or whether you want to, um, you know, um, get uh, into this mini Buddha statue project or, you know, there's so many things there <laughs> and uh, all your donations are most welcome at this exciting state of the new monastery development. As you know, there's a process of making these, you know, the environment, a monastery from a house, as well as the, you know, the mundane things like repairs and new items. So it's a lot of things to think about and uh, a lot of, um, it's exciting and challenging, but I think with all the community, uh, we can go there, we can achieve that. And... Um, and you know that today's Sutta discussion and all the other teachings from Anukampa Bhikkhuni project are all offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And with your generosity, Anukampa Bhikkhuni project and Venerable Chanda and all the other future venerables can provide uh, the community and the wider world with valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, meditation retreats, all those things. And if you like to support the new monastery and the Sangha's requisites, you are invited to donate. Um, I'll put the link below. And um, there are different ways of, um, um, you know, getting uh, getting into different um, areas that you are good at. And um, you can give a dana. You can, there is a WhatsApp group to get involved if you like. Uh, it is called Afa Anukampa Food at Ready because this this monastery is a little bit away from the supermarkets and um, it is uh, you know it is good to organize supermarket deliveries uh, because the guests can't just nip out and get something quickly. So if you want to be in that WhatsApp group, uh, email to team at anukampaproject.org and let them know that you like to get involved and then we can go from there and uh, if you see in the uh, website there is another thing called needed items so the guests or venerables will update it um, uh, whenever there's a needed item and you can even if you are abroad you can buy from a UK supermarket and uh, deliver it to the uh, the monastery. So there are different ways of, um, uh, you know, getting involved and being part of the community. And uh, thank you very much for being part of the community. <laughs> sadu, 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 beautifully said. And lastly, there's another way, which is that you can come to these events, but also you can come visit the monastery. Although we're quite full already, before we've even moved we've already booked you in um you never know we might squeeze a few more in so <laughs> try your luck <laughs> yeah and and also the point of the future venerables this is not to feed venerable chando although i will eat the food at the moment um <laughs> this is to feed basically teachers of the future as well they always say in the buddhist text the sangha present and yet to come so let there be a sangha yet to come, and I'm sure there will. <laughs>
Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, maybe our guests would like to come and wave goodbye. You can see our wonderful guests come into the screen. So this is wonderful Han, who has been giving, sharing all her wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> nice meeting you all. Lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs> and this is uh, this is Chi, who's asking some great questions, and Jenny as well. Yeah. So there they all are. <laughs> And uh, thank you all for being here. I hope to see you next week. Next week, it will be Venerable Lupeka, in fact, for the next three, because I'm in America. I forgot to say that. Um, unfortunately, not near Emily, <laughs> who's in Massachusetts. Yeah, but I'll be in um, Portland and Seattle. So if you happen to be near Seattle, I don't think anyone will. I'll be teaching there too. I'll be teaching a meta retreat in Portland and then a, a trip to Seattle to see some monastic friends. And uh, do a little bit of teaching there too. Uh, so for the next three weeks, the sessions will continue. There'll be a meta meditation tomorrow. I'll probably lead it unless I'm really tired. I'm really tired actually, but if I can, I will. I'm gonna always put the dates in, and then Venerable Rebecca will do them for the next few. Uh, yeah, there's a gap there for when we're moving on the 22nd of March. <laughs> We've actually given ourselves a break that day because <laughs> we tend to do quite a lot. <laughs> But we gave ourselves a break on the day of the move. So, all right, shall we unmute everyone and you can uh, say your goodbyes? It's nice to hear your voices. <laughs>